Hello. Um, so, um, hello everybody. Today I will talk to you about uh, microRNAs in extracellular vesicles and how they orchestrate the biology of the tumor microenvironment. First of all, I would like to um, make my disclosure, so I have no financial relationships to disclose. The outline of today's talk will be uh, essentially in these four points. The first part of the lecture will be on the classification of extracellular vesicles, and we will talk about the physiology of microRNAs, since the topic of this talk is uh, the role of microRNAs in extracellular vesicles and how they shape the biology of the tumor microenvironment. Then we will talk about the uh, classical or traditional uh, mechanisms of action of microRNAs and their alternative or more novel discoveries about how they work. And then uh, we will talk about the discovery of mere scepters, and I will define what I mean by that, and uh, uh, what is their implication in the biology of the tumor microenvironment. And then we will focus a little bit more on uh, a specific um, aspect of the biology of uh, um, vesicular microRNAs with reference to um, the natural killer derived exosomal microRNAs and how they shape the biology of the TME. So um, the classification of extracellular vesicles um, is listed here. It's not complete and it's constantly changing. So, um, but it reflects essentially what we know as of yet regarding how we can classify extracellular vesicles. A lot of people think that the term exosome is a synonym uh, for extracellular vesicles. Well, this is incorrect because exosomes are just the one subtype of uh, EV or, or extracellular vesicles, uh, which includes a, a broader family of vesicles. And uh, to be more specific, exosomes can be considered as the, some of the smallest type of vesicles. Indeed, as you see in, the, in this slide under the size column, you see that exosomes have a range in size between 40 and 120 nanometers, whereas microvesicles have a range between 50 nanometers and one micron. And then we have apoptotic bodies that range between 500 nanometers and two microns. But there are also other uh, categories of EVs that have been more recently identified. One includes smaller vesicles than exosomes, that are the ectosomes, that are between 10 and 20 nanometers. And then we have uh, large um, oncosomes that are actually vesicles that are bigger than the, than the apoptotic bodies and whose size range is between one micron and 10 microns. Now, as you can see from this slide, though, that a pure size is not good enough to differentiate a different type of vesicles because there are areas of overlapping if you just look at the size of them. Let's say, for instance, you have a vesicle that is 100 nanometers. You wouldn't be able, just based on the size, to determine or to state that that vesicle is an exosome or a microvesicle. So how can you differentiate between these two different groups of vesicles? There are different criteria. Um, some of them uh, include essentially looking at surface marker expression. In particular, exosomes tend to express tetraspanins such as T-span 29, T-span 30, um, other, mem uh, other molecules such as TSG 101 and so on. Microvesicles tend to express integrins, CD40 ligand, and selectins. Apoptotic bodies are characterized by the extensive amount of phosphatidyl serine because of the flapping of the um, uh, lipids in the membrane when the, the, the cell dies. Um, originally, it was quite difficult to differentiate different type of EVs. So at some point, the International Society for Extracellular Vesicles, ISEV, came up with uh, um, a series of guidelines that uh, are called the minimal requirement for the definition of an extracellular vesicle as an exosome or as another type of EVs among the, the, the different listed before. And I have to say that this is a very helpful uh, tool because uh, it allows all scientists from different labs to essentially start talking the same language and start defining their vesicles uh, with the proper name based on the criteria that uh, need to be met in order to 
um, define a vesicle in a certain way or another. These uh, guidelines are constantly updated. There has been an update in uh, November of 2017 from the original publication in December 2014. And we, are, we have constantly, so, so you are encouraged to follow the updates that the society uh, provides in terms of the requirement for the definition of uh, different subcategories of EVs. Um, just to keep going about the physiology of these extracellular vesicles, uh, the, the exosomes, so the, the category that ranges between 30, 40 to 120 nanometers in size and expresses tetraspanins, are derived from the endosomal compartment. So as you can see here, they are um, originating through different mechanisms involving escort dependent and escort independent machinery from the MVB here at the center of the slide, which stays for multivesicular body. And then these uh, MVBs under, undergo a maturation inside of the cytosol of the cell and can essentially follow two paths. One is to go through degradation inside of lysosomes. The other one is to migrate through the plasma membrane, um, mainly thanks to RAB27 members uh, that allows the migration of the late MVB through the plasma membrane, where the membrane of the MVB fuses with the plasma membrane, releasing the little tiny exosomes outside of the cell. Um, differently than that, you have that uh, microvesicles, as you can see in the upper left part of this cartoon, seem to originate mostly from a direct blabbing of the plasma membrane, so with the minimum involvement of the um, endosomal compartment and machinery. Um, this is, uh, at this point, almost a historic uh, image. Uh, it was one of the first uh, images of uh, um, extracellular vesicles blabbing from the surface of uh, uh, glioblastoma cells. Uh, in this seminal paper um, of uh, uh, Dr. Skog with uh, um, coming from the group of Sandra Brakefield at Harvard, they were able to show indeed for the first time that there is, um, that, that these vesicles blabbing from the surface of cells can actually be imaged. And uh, extracellular vesicles really contain a, a whole different uh, types of cargo molecules. Essentially, it has been shown that every possible macromolecule you can think of can uh, be part of the cargo of EVs. So inside of EVs, you can find uh, proteins, of course. You can find also, I'm not sure what happened here. So, okay, so you can find EV, you can find proteins, you can find messenger RNAs, you can find um, non-coding RNAs, both microRNAs and long non-coding RNAs, and people have described also um, DNA inside of vesicles. And also, as I said previously, vesicles are characterized by the different type of molecules that define their surface um, landscape. Um, uh, Briefly, I would like to go through some seminal discoveries on the role of extracellular vesicles in cancer. This is from the group of David Leiden, and they were the first to provide evidence that uh, melanoma-derived exosomes are able to educate uh, bone marrow progenitors by transferring um, the uh, oncogenic oncogene mat. And also they were able to show that exosomes are able to induce a vascular leakiness at the premetastatic niche. And uh, so if you block RAB27A, which is one of the um, proteins involved in the migration of the multivesicular body to the plasma membrane, this decreases the exosome formation and metastasis. And they were able to identify also specific exosomic uh, melanoma signature, which involves genes such as TIR2, BLA4, HSP70, and MAT, um, with prognostic implications. So it was a, the first paper really showing convincingly that the protein and oncogene can be transferred from uh, cancer-derived exosomes to cells of the premetastatic niche, priming it to receive metastatic cells. And then another uh, seminal paper here from uh, um, Mikiel Pechtel and uh, Jakob van Rienen. They were able to show that uh, for the first time in vivo, that there is an effect of uh, um, exosomes on uh, um, 
other cells of the tumor microenvironment. So vesicles released from the cancer cells can actually have an effect that can be actually documented in vivo uh, on uh, other cells of the tumor microenvironment using a very elegant system uh, that uh, combines a Crelox uh, evidence of, of an effect of uh, um, the content, the cargo of vesicles on the recipient cells in the TME in vivo. Then uh, Ragu Kalluri's group provided the first evidence that uh, surface uh, um, markers of vesicles such as glipican 1 can be used to identify cancer-derived exosomes, uh, particularly beneficial in the early diagnosis of pancreatic cancer, so providing a lot of uh, uh, hope, of course, for patients that have this type of cancer because, uh, as you know and as we speak, this is still a very deadly type of cancer and the early diagnosis represents probably the most powerful uh, tool we have uh, as of yet for the um, healing and the treatment of this disease. So having an early uh, marker uh, to be detected in, in uh, a circulating exosome is certainly a very powerful uh, tool against this disease. Another important uh, paper, again, from the uh, group of David Leiden, um, uh, provided the first evidence that actually vesicles are involved in the tropism of uh, uh, metastatic cells. So in other words, um, cancer cells seems to be directed to a specific target metastatic organ um, after this organ has been primed by the vesicles, by the exosome released by these cancer cells. So they did a series of very elegant experiments showing that if you have, let's say, um, a cancer, a breast cancer cell line that has tropism for the lung, and one breast cancer cell line that has a tropism for the brain, for instance, if you prime the animal with the exosomes derived from the cell that has tropism from the lung, and then you put the cells that tends to go to the brain, these cells actually will go to the lung just because there has been a priming uh, from the exosomes derived from a lung tropic uh, cell line. So this was a very powerful evidence that vesicles have a, an incredible uh, central role, play an incredible central, ro central role in the definition of the target organ for met the metastatic process. They were able also to identify which genes are involved in this traffic of the vesicles, uh, showing in particular that specific type of integrins expressed in the surface of the vesicles tend to define a certain uh, tropic tropism, certain organ uh, as the um, uh, destination of the vesicle itself. And then uh, the group of Dolores Di Vizio and colleagues at Cedar sinai uh, have provided a very uh, broad and extensive definition of the role of large oncosomes, so they're the biggest group of vesicles we can think of as of yet. So the ones that range from, uh, let's say, one micron to 10 micron, they were able to show that uh, specifically highly metastatic uh, prostate cancer cells tend to release this large oncosome um, uh, and uh, uh, this contributes significantly to the metastatic process. So this was a little bit of a um, background on some of the most relevant literature in the field. And now I want to go a little bit more specifically on the topic of this talk, defining the, after I define the vesicles, defining the other main uh, character in this plot, in this story that I'm about to share with you. So microRNAs. Um, I'm not sure uh, all of you are familiar with microRNAs. That's why I provided this apparently complicated slide, but actually it's not that complicated if you follow me step by step, that tells you about the biogenesis and especially the physiology and the function of microRNAs. So starting from the um, elliptical blue area in the upper left side of these uh, uh, supposed to be gigantic cell that represents the nucleus of the cell. So ju just to tell you that microRNA is like every other protein coding gene is actually a, is a, a gene. So uh, is a piece of DNA which is transcribed uh, through a, to into a pre microRNA. So primordial PRI microRNA. You have to pay attention to letters here to PRI. And so this primordial microRNA is then processed inside of the nucleus of the cell by an enzyme called Drosha with a coenzyme called the DGCR8. 
into a precursor microRNA, so PRE microRNA, which is characterized by a herpin structure, is a herpin precursor. And this pre um, uh, pre-microRNA is then shifted from the nucleus inside of the, inside of the cytoplasm of the cell by means of exporting 5 with a coenzyme called RANGTP. And here, uh, the pre-microRNA emits a, a ribonuclear nucleoprotein complex called RISC, which is composed of different parts. The first one is DICER, which essentially takes away the loop of the mirror, leaving a duplex, which is opened by a helicase. And then for thermodynamic uh, reasons, one of the two strands of the duplex is uh, um, preferred and becomes the mature single-stranded microRNA, which is long about 19 to 24 nucleotides and guided by other uh, proteins in the risk complex, mainly Argonaut 2 in humans, um, finds an, a complementary or almost complementary sequence in a target messenger RNA, mostly but not exclusively, as we will see in a minute, um, at the three prime UTR end of the transcript. As a consequence, you can have um, mostly a translational repression if, if there is an imperfect base pair pairing of the microRNA with the target messenger RNA. Sometimes, and especially in plants more than in humans, you have a perfect match between all the bases of the microRNA and the target messenger RNA, in which case you have an actual cleavage of both the messenger RNA and the microRNA. Uh, in 2007, uh, a brilliant discovery by Vasudevan and colleagues showed for the first time that actually um, microRNA can also bind to the 5' prime UTR of uh, uh, a gene. And uh, as a consequence of that, you can have actually an increased translation. So not a decreased translation, but actually increased expression of the proteins. Uh, here is a summary of the possible outcome of a microRNA messenger RNA interaction. Most frequently, you have what's happening in the top um, part of the cartoon. So you have the microRNA attached to the uh, risk complex binding to the three prime UTR of the target messenger RNA. And you can have a messenger RNA degradation, especially if the match is perfect. Or you can have translational repression if the match is imperfect or doesn't occur in all of the 100%, all the bases of the microRNA matching to the 3' prime UTR. Um, if you have a binding to the 5' prime UTR region, you can have still a translational repression, but you can have also the translational activation I was mentioning before. MicroRNA can also bind to the coding sequence, and this almost invariably um, results into a translational repression, and uh, that's pretty much all the outcome you can have. Having said that, uh, in uh, more recent years, um, uh, different groups have shown that uh, in addition to these traditional mechanisms of action of microRNA, which, is, which are the ones we just analyzed, you can have also alternative mechanisms of action, which are listed here. In the left, you see, again, one of the first um, alternative mechanisms, as I said, is the fact that the mirrors can actually increase the translation of a messenger RNA into a protein. And then on the right side, you have um, a brilliant observation done by um, Dr. Ehring. At the time, she was working in Dr. Danilo Perotti's lab. They were the first to show that a microRNA can actually interact directly uh, with a protein, so not with a messenger RNA. In this specific work, they were showing that mere 328, by binding to um, a protein called HRNPE2, were able to subtract or take away this HRNPE2 factor from its binding to a transcription factor called CEBP alpha. Uh, normally, HRNPE2 inhibits uh, CEBP alpha, but the presence of the mir prevents this inhibition, and so CEBP alpha allows the transcription of factors that allow a granulocytic differentiation. Now, in leukemias, you have a down regulation of mir 328. Therefore, HRNPE2 is free to bind and inhibit CEBP alpha, so there is a block in granulocytic differentiation, which is key to the... Um, um, leukemic process, leukemogenic process. But the point here that I'm trying to highlight is the fact that this paper is the first one showing a completely different mechanism of action for microRNAs as um, able to interact with uh, um, 
uh, a protein instead of a messenger RNA. So this is very important, this observation that microRNAs can bind to protein is very important for the story I'm about to share. The other background to the story is this table, which is just a very um, oversimplification of the, uh, of the situation, but it gives you an idea where we are going from here. So at some point in the microRNA history, uh, people started looking at uh, the expression of microRNAs in the blood first, and then essentially they started looking at all possible biological fluids. And uh, the first uh, paper uh, that actually looked at microRNAs from this perspective is actually the second one listed here, so to give the right credit to the right people, so that, uh, by Mitchell et al. They showed that in prostate cancer patients, you have high level of circulating in the blood mere 141 compared to healthy men, the, the, the other counterpart. So uh, why is this uh, paper important and the other ones listed here? Because these were the first um, papers showing for the first time that microRNAs can be, can be effectively used as cancer biomarkers because they can be found in uh, uh, biological fluids and they can actually predict if a patient has cancer or not. Um, in those years, actually in 2007, uh, Valadi et al., uh, the group of Jan Lotval, provided a very, uh, the very first evidence that uh, microRNAs can be shuttled functionally from one cell to another inside of extracellular vesicles. And when I mean, what I, what I mean by functionally, I mean that uh, um, cell number one here, you see mast cell number one, releases microRNAs inside of extracellular vesicles. And if you take the supernatant, not the cell, but just the supernatant from this cell culture, mast cell number one, and you put it on the top of mast cell number two, which is in a completely different flask, and so has never been in any contact with mast cell number one, except for the fact that you put the supernatant derived from number one into number two, you have that these microRNA contained in the vesicles released by mast cell number one enter into my, my mast cell number two, and they start targeting messenger RNAs in these uh, recipient cell. It was a, a very fundamental observation that essentially was telling us that microRNA can shuttle from one cell to another inside of EDs. So now, putting these three pieces of evidence I just provided in the previous uh, three slides together, so the fact that microRNAs can bind to proteins, the fact that they can be found circulating, and the fact that they can be transferred from one cell to another, prompted me and my group uh, to think of microRNAs in a completely different setting, not only as uh, regulators of gene expression by modulating the translation rate of messenger RNA, but actually as hormones. Because if you think of hormones, the definition of a hormone is a molecule which is secreted by one cell, which is part of a gland, goes into circulation and does something on an effector cell, so at a distance, by binding mostly through uh, to a protein receptor. So it seems like the, the picture here uh, fits quite nicely the definition of a hormone. Of course, this was a very high risk idea because hormones are considered to be mainly belong to two categories, being proteins or uh, lipids. Nobody has ever thought of um, hormones as being nucleic acids. But uh, we decided to move on with this hypothesis because it seemed quite uh, um, possible based on the premises. So uh, in 2012, uh, we published a paper uh, in which we started by uh, screening which microRNAs were included as a cargo of extracellular vesicles released, released by non-small cell lung cancer cell lines. And as you see in the uh, panel A, you, here we have uh, several dots, each of them representing a microRNA detected with the nanostring technology as cargo of microRNA derived from uh, these cancer cell lines. And then the red bar that you see actually represents the statistical threshold so that whatever is underneath is considered noise, so it's not necessarily really there. 
But so basically this killed a lot of our candidates, but uh, we still had nine candidates that were expressed above the threshold. And then we decided to validate these list of nine candidates with an, another technique, which was the quantitative real-time PCR, which you see listed in B here. And we ended up showing that indeed um, there were like in particular MIR-21 and MIR-29A, which were highly expressed in the lung cancer cell line compared to a cell line which was used as a control, 293 cells that, as you know, are not um, lung cells and are not even cancer cells. So we had at this point two candidates, MIR-21 and 29A, that were very highly uh, represented as cargo of uh, uh, vesicles released by uh, non-small cell lung cancer cell lines. But then the problem was, okay, so if these hormones, if these microRNA work as hormones, first off, how do they work and what is the destination cell? So we decided to look at different proteins that uh, are known to bind to single-stranded RNA, which are about 19 to 24 nucleotides in size. And actually, there were two excellent candidates, and they belong to the family of toll-like receptor family, family, in particular toll-like receptor 7 and 8, that are known to bind to single-stranded RNA of viral origin, so exogenous to the cell, that's their main function, to defend cells from uh, infections from exogenous RNAs. But we thought they might, perhaps they could be also mere receptors, so receptors of microRNA um, uh, transfer, for instance, from a cancer cell uh, to a recipient cell. So we started a series of experiments uh, of co-localization that are listed here. So first off, we um, focused on the uh, top three, uh, the, the top two candidates we, we obtained from the previous screening, so MIR-21 and 29A. We used the MIR-16 because it was expressed equally in lung cancer cells and in uh, 293 cells. And uh, so uh, we use the LISO tracker to label the endosomal compartment where the toll-like receptor 7 and 8 are located inside of the cytoplasm of cells. We uh, labeled um, the toll-like receptor 8 itself with uh, um, green uh, GFP, and we created artificial exosomes containing the microRNAs of interest labeled in red. And uh, when we did the merging images, when you see yellow, it means co-localization. So we observed that all three uh, microRNAs are able to enter the recipient cell from the artificial exosomes and localize in the endosomal compartment where the toll-like is located. Of course, this doesn't mean that the mirror interacts with the receptor. For that, we had to perform immunoprecipitations that you see in the bar in the upper right side. So here we uh, precipitated the um, protein, so the toll-like receptor, and we observed an enrichment for MIR-21 and 29A, but not so much for uh, MIR-16. Whereas below, you see that we pull down the microRNA and you obtain toll-like receptor Eight, only with MIR uh, 29A and MIR 21, but not with MIR 16 or DOTAP, which is the empty vesicle that we use, plus all the other controls. And then the um, images you see underneath, they show that the main producer of these, uh, ves these microRNAs, in this case is MIR 29A represented here, is uh, actually the cancer cell, not the normal uh, lung tissue counterpart. So we, so we performed a series of uh, co-localization experiments uh, in situ hybridization. And at the end of the day, we were able to show that the recipient cell is the um, um, tumor-associated macrophage, especially at the so-called tumor interface. So at the line uh, of uh, uh, demarcation between the cancerous tissue and the normal, and the normal tissue surrounding it. And so we were able to formulate this model in which we see that the cancer cell, the non-small cell and cancer cell, is able to secrete uh, vesicles containing MIR-21 and MIR-29A that is updating, updated, uptaken by tumor-associated macrophages, especially the interface with the tumor. And here the um, exosome, or vesicles, I should say, fuses with the endosomal compartment where the toll-like receptor 8 in human 
or its counterpart uh, in mouse, which is TLR7, is able to bind uh, literally physically with the microRNA, uh, triggering the downstream signaling of uh, the receptor, which is an F kappa beta signaling, which induces the secretion of TNF alpha and interleukin 6, which promote, promote tumor growth and the metastatic potential. In a later publication in 2015, um, Dr. Chalagundla, who now uh, at the time was a postdoc in my lab, now is an assistant professor at the University of uh, Nebraska. So he was able to show that the same crosstalk is important in neuroblastoma, so in pediatric uh, cancer. And uh, again, neuroblastoma cells uh, like lung cancer cells previously are able to secrete MIR-21. Uh, interestingly, we didn't see the secretion of MIR-29A from this cell line. But this MIR-21 then is uptaken by the tumor-associated macrophages where it binds to toll-like receptor 8, triggers an F-kappa beta activation, which um, transactivates the expression of MIR-155, so another microRNA, normally uh, very um, a little expressed in the cancer cell itself. So the upregulation of MIR-155 in the macrophage uh, makes uh, it also uh, packed inside of the exosomes derived from these macrophages and transfer back to the cancer cell where this microRNA targets genes such as TERF1, which is an inhibitor of telomerase activity, which induces increased telomerase activity and increased resistance to cisplatin, showing that this uh, uh, aberrant crosstalk between um, cancer cells and macrophages mediated by the binding to a mere receptor, TLR8, uh, is actually relevant also for the mechanisms of drug resistance. Now I'm shifting gears a little bit and telling you about some more recent studies that are being performed, have been performed and are being performed in my lab. Um, so we focused on a, another important uh, cellular component of innate immunity, which are the natural killer cells. As you know, natural killer cells are uh, prime cells to destroy virally infected cells as well as tumor cells. Uh, however, so and they responded to a series of signals uh, exchanged between the um, cell uh, and the NK cell itself. In particular, some signals are uh, permissive, so they actually allow the killing of the cell by the NK cells. Some other cells, some other signals are inhibitory, so they tell NK cells essentially, do not kill me. Uh, and based on the combination of these two groups of signals, you have an outcome, which is the fact that the NK cell actually does kill or not. But uh, to complicate things, uh, what happens in the tumor microenvironment is that uh, um, it has been shown quite clearly at this point that the tumor microenvironment of several type of cancers is literally imbued, so full, enriched in TGF beta. And TGF beta is a profound inhibitor of NK killing activity. So one of the ways for um, cancer cells to um, escape the killing by NK cells is indeed to have a microenvironment which is particularly rich of TGF beta. The idea here, uh, the overarching hypothesis here of this project is that perhaps we can uh, use uh, exosomes, so particles derived from NK cells instead of NK cells themselves to kill cancer cells. And why would we think of that? For a series of reasons. The first one is that one of the problems that you have every time really you perform a cell therapy, so NK cell therapy included, is that you have one, uh, one important side effect of the injection of cells as therapeutics in patients is that you might have the so-called cytokine storm, which is a situation in which there is like an, a, a strong secretion of cytokines that can actually lead to important side effects like a very excruciating headache or very high fever that ultimately uh, might lead the oncologist even to stop the treatment because the, the side effects are just unbearable. And so at this point, the therapy is not effective anymore because you have to stop it because of side effects. So the idea here is that perhaps with the vesicles instead of the cells themselves, you might actually be able to uh, prevent this cytokine storm issue to, from happening. The other possibilities, which is number two here, is that uh, 
you know, cancer cells, especially leukemic cells, tend to have nests, so to hide um, in the so-called pharmacologic sanctuaries. So one being the brain, another one being the testis, where there is like a brain blood barrier or a testis blood barrier that prevents um, therapeutics and actually in particular cell therapeutics to cross the barrier and enter that compartment where the cancer cell is actually nesting. So, um, and it has been shown actually at this point by several papers that vesicles derived from different type of cells, including N and NK cells, seems to be able to cross quite easily these um, uh, barriers, these anatomical barrier uh, that, uh, um, you know, cancer cells uh, used to, to hide. And so this way, these uh, vesicles as therapeutics can actually reach also these pharmacological sanctuaries. Then, of course, all the signaling uh, that occurs between cancer cells and NK cells, so in, in particular the inhibitory signaling, perhaps are not at stake, are not necessarily involved in the killing mediated by vesicles, if you use vesicles instead of this NK cell as therapeutic. So based on all these uh, um, ideas, we decided to follow up on these um, interesting hypotheses. And uh, first off, you know, to, to make sure that we can even go this way, we have to be able to obtain big quantities of exosomes derived from NK cells. And this has been possible, thank you, thanks to this uh, paper by Denman et al. that has been uh, optimized in collaboration with Dr. Bob Seeger and Dr. Young at Children's Hospital Los Angeles. Um, we were able to... Um, develop this uh, modified protocol in which we start from peripheral blood mononuclear cells that are put in contact with engineered K562 cells so that uh, essentially after like two weeks of co-culture you have a population of uh, more than 95% uh, pure NK cells from which you can isolate vesicles that are at this point almost all derived from NK cells that are activated. And uh, so then we were able to define the properties of these NK-derived vesicles and define that they fulfill the minimal requirement uh, of ISAC, the International Society, to call them exosomes. So that's why we use this term from now on. But of course, the $1 million question is, are these vesicles able actually to kill cancer cells or not? So here you see in two different neuroblastoma cell lines uh, that it progressing from the left to the right, you have progressively increasing concentration of vesicles and K-derived vesicles. And these cells, these cancer cells are luciferous labels. So when they die, when they are killed, you see a down regulation in the signal because the cells are not, uh, you know, um, expressing the cipheres anymore because they're dying. So you see that in both cases, at some point we have, we reach a, a concentration of vesicles that are able to significantly inhibit the um, uh, growth of these cells or to kill these cells, I should say. And interestingly, while in CHLA255, so if you look at the green bars here, there seems to be a plateau that is reached after which even if you keep going up with the concentration of vesicles, the cells do not keep kill, uh, being killed more and more. In the CHLA136, so in the purple bars, you see that there seems to be a progressively increased dying with the uh, increased concentration of vesicles. Then we performed a series of functional experiments. These were performed by Dr. Nediani. Uh, now he's directing an uh, extracellular vesicle core facility at Children's Hospital Los Angeles, which I encourage you to check in on the website if you need uh, excellent work characterizing your vesicles. At the time, he was a postdoc in my lab, and he performed these experiments showing that um, especially not only um, vesicles are able to kill as well as NK cells, but what we observed is that if you have an environment in which you have TGF beta, then uh, NK cells are not killing anymore, as we expect, but NK derived exosomes keep killing as if TGF beta wasn't present. And so this is a very important observation because it tells us that uh, an advantage that honestly we didn't even foresee when we were thinking of using vesicles versus the cells. An advantage, a further advantage of using uh, vesicles over the cells is actually that they can work and they can kill cancer cells even in presence of a lot of TGF beta, which was that uh, cytokine that was inhibiting the function of NK cells. 
And of course, then um, we also performed this experiment in which we um, um, silenced the uh, expression of drosha, which is key in the machinery of uh, um, microRNAs. And we were able to, so basically we silenced drosha in NK cells. So at this point, we impaired the production of um, microRNA by NK cells. We took the exosome from these treated um, cells, NK cells, and we put it on the top of CHLA-136 and checked for the killing. And as you can see, if you silence drosha, these vesicles from NK cells are not as good as in, in killing as neuroblastoma cells as if the drosha was present. So that tells us that microRNAs are among the different components of the cargo of these NK-derived cells are some important uh, mediators of the killing effect. So what are the microRNAs contained in the um, NK-derived um, uh, exosomes? We have a list here uh, done in collaboration with Dr. Seeger at CHLA. And among the different candidates, we were really interested in the one that has been highlighted, MIR-186. The reason being because it is predicted bioinformatically to target some very important genes in neuroblastoma, uh, such as MIC-N, that, as you know, is the driving oncogene in this disease. And as you know, also, as of now, it, it is not a targetable gene because pharmacologically, it's impossible to target MIC-N. So using a microRNA to target it could be an interesting um, approach. In addition to that, you see the TGF-beta receptor one is a predicted target, as well as downstream mediators of, of the TGF-beta receptor pathways, so, so SMAD2 and 3 and ALK, and Aurora kinase A, which is also a, a stabilizer of MIC-N. So by targeting Aurora kinase A, you can also indirectly target MIC-N. So for all these reason, reasons, we focused on MIR-186. But first, I just want to show you this slide that shows that with a technique based on size exclusion chromatography, we were able to um, separate different, isolate different fractions of uh, uh, extracellular vesicles. And you can observe that the marker CD81 and TSG101 of exosomes starts appearing in fractions, I would say, between 11 and 14, which happens to be also where you have the highest amount of MIR-186, which is contained in the NK-derived exosome, and an acceptable amount of contaminating proteins, which come uh, out later on in the uh, later fractions. So using this method, we decided to proceed with our experiment. But first, we wanted to see if MIR-186 actually targets the, geno the genes of interest. And here you can see that if you transfect neuroblastoma cell lines to different cell lines with MIR-186, you have downregulation of MIC-N or orokinase A. And we performed also um, luciferase reporter assays showing that indeed MIR-186 targets directly MIC-N and Aurora kinase A. And this effect is exactly in the predicted binding site because if you mutagenize these sites or you delete it, then the uh, luciferase activity is not uh, reduced anymore. But then we observed also that the MIR is targeting the TGF beta signaling um, by targeting SMAT2 and SMAT3. Uh, luciferase was not uh, significant for SMAT2 and SMAT3, so that means that the MIR is not directly targeting these two genes, but indirectly. We don't know exactly what is the mediator of this silencing. But we know also that in addition to TGF-beta R1, MIR-186 also targets TGF-beta R2, so both receptors. And this is quite profound because, as I told you, TGF-beta is an immunosuppressor because it interacts with the TGF-beta pathway. Um, very important is the, the uh, graph that you see in the, see in the bottom left side, because here we use the reporter uh, system to show activation of the TGF beta pathway. And here we show that even in presence of the agonist, so of TGF beta, the pathway is completely silenced if MIR-186 is expressed. So it, it, that tells you that MIR-186 effect on the pathway is so profound that its, its presence is able to block the activation of the pathway even in presence of the agonist, of, so of TGF beta itself. Um, we performed uh, um, growth curves for the neuroblastoma cell lines in presence of MIR-186, showing that their growth is reduced. And also in a scratch wound healing assay, we observed that the presence of MIR-186 reduces the migration of neuroblastoma cells. 
and reduces also the migration in presence of a chemo attractant through a, a trans well um, migration assays. So all of these um, experiments essentially are in uh, agreement uh, with a tumor suppressive role of MIR-186. Then we were able, Dr. Neviani was able to generate um, anionic lipopolyplex nanoparticles containing MIR-186, and uh, they can be actually um, coated with different type of antibodies. Um, and according to the type of antibody that you coat them with, you can direct them and their microRNA content to one cell or another of the tumor microenvironment. Here is just to show that the, the, uh, if you transfect NK cells with uh, uh, these nanoparticles containing MIR-186, uh, in particular, if you coat them with the antibody against the CD56, which is the marker for NK cells, you're able to deliver more efficiently this MIR in NK cells, and you can find it also in the exosomes derived from NK cells. And likewise, if you silence MIR-186 with an anti-MIR-186 um, uh, um, lock nucleic acid antisense. Uh, we perform these uh, um, in panel B. You see the Dow regulation of the relevant genes TGF beta receptor 1 and 2 in NK cells. So um, we have here a situation where the same microRNA can be uh, beneficial both if you transfer it to the cancer cells because of its effect on MICN and relevant oncogenes, but also on the NK cells themselves because by silencing TGF beta receptor expression and the downstream pathway, you can silence the inhibitory effect of TGF beta on the NK function. And then we performed the in vivo experiment showing uh, that in orthotopic models of neuroblastoma, so here we injected neuroblastoma cells in the perirenal capsule of these mice where neuroblastoma develops, and uh, these uh, cells are um, Lucifer is expressing, so you can actually follow the growth of the tumor in, vi in vivo. Uh, four groups of animals. In the upper side, you see the animals treated with injection of the nanoparticles, as I showed you before, containing scramble, so nothing in them, and coated with an aspecific IgG antibody. And you see that the tumors keep growing. Uh, whereas in the second group, you have a nanoparticle containing MIR-186 and coated with an aspecific antibody. In the third group from the top, you see the nanoparticle containing scramble and coated with anti-GD2 antibody. GD2 is a specific surface marker for neuroblastoma. And then the fourth group, so the, the bottom row of mice, which is the actual experimental group. Here you have animals treated with nanoparticles containing MIR-186 and coated with anti-GD2 antibody. So clearly because probably the nanoparticle is more effective in delivering the MIR to the cancer cells, you see that the tumors grow much, much less and the survival is increased. So overall, um, I will summarize these uh, um, findings by saying that uh, extracellular vesicles, as you, um, I hope you have been convinced by now, can be classified in different subtypes and exosomes are a subtype of EVs. Uh, EVs are involved in several aspects of cancer biology, as the literature I, I briefly mentioned showed you. Uh, EV, RNAs, uh, shape, uh, EV RNA shapes the biology of the tumor microenvironment. In particular, microRNA can affect this biology by working through the traditional mechanisms and alternative mechanisms, including the binding to a receptor and activation of its downstream signaling. TLR8 represents the first form, and as of now, the only one I'm aware of, of mere receptors, so a receptor for microRNA. It is important for cancer growth, dissemination, and resistant to therapy. MIR-186 in NK derived exosome has an anti-tumor effect, likely working by targeting MICN or orokinase A and blocking the TGF beta receptor and downstream signaling pathway. And antibody-coated nanoparticles can specifically deliver microRNA or anti-microRNA cargo to target cells. And I would like to conclude by acknowledging um, several people uh, in my, my previous lab at the Children's Hospital Los Angeles, the Dr. Neviani is in the upper picture, the second one from the left, uh, who performed uh, several of the experiments I showed you, and uh, um, people in my uh, more recently established uh, lab at the University of Hawaii Cancer Center in the bottom picture, and of course the funding agencies that supported these studies uh, the um, both federal agencies and 
fa private foundation, and of course the patients and their families for providing the samples for these studies. And I thank you so much for your attention. I will uh, wait for your questions that you might have, and I will try to answer them as soon as possible. Thank you so much.